looks like this. Had to get tur that turned back on there. I'll move to approve the agenda. Motion from Stephanie to be the second. I'll second. Second from Arya. Those in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Agenda approved. Moving on. I can pull it up. Uh, comments from the chair. So I have a couple of things of note. The first is that we have uh, reappointments coming up. Um, actually didn't write it down, but I think it's this Wednesday or next Wednesday. I don't remember the, the date. I don't think it's this week. It's not this week. I think they pushed it to October something. It may even be October 11th. It's uh, 13th, Wednesday the 13th. 13th at, at uh, and the, the city council meetings normally start at, is it 6? Six? 6.30, I believe. Okay. So it's usually the very know. early in the agenda. You, you need to reapply online using the, the forms, you know, uh, that the city provides, fill in that info. I just cut and paste from my resume pretty much when I do it. Um, the profanity filter does not like uh, Latin honors. You can figure that out for yourself. Um, just an FYI. Uh, so everybody reapply online. Um, if you plan to, please let me know if you don't. Uh, I know that, that um, Barb's told us that she doesn't plan to reapply. Um, Mike has told us before that there are other people applying outside the current planning commission. So be aware of that too. If you, if you don't end up applying, there's other people lined up. Uh, and it's probably a good idea to go to that October 13th meeting at 6.30. Uh, the city council might ask us to comment or something. Um, so make sure everybody's aware of that. Uh, another thing that's coming up is this Thursday at 530, we're holding a special planning commission meeting just to go over some um, short term zoning changes. Uh, I got to arrange to meet with Mike in the next few days. So Mike, you email me and tell me your availability and um, I have a few meetings this week, but we'll we'll figure out a time during the day we can we can chat about it. Mike and I are going to chat about uh, possible larger density changes um, for us to discuss at the meeting on Thursday. But we'll hope to to polish something um, so we're not trying to figure it out on the spot on Thursday. So everybody, be ready for that. We got to make sure we have a quorum because we do have to vote to to pass things out. So. If you if you don't plan to be there Thursday, I guess you should um, email Mike and I to let us know so that we can be aware of whether there's going to be a problem with quorum. Um, th those are the big things I have. Uh, hey, for anybody who's done the reappointment, do you can you tell me where the appropriate forms are on the website? I find that to be kind of Byzantine. Uh, I already did it. I, I, I Googled, I think, but there might be something in an email. I think, email. I think Mike sends an email with a link. You should read Mike's emails more closely. Thank you. If you still can, right. let me know. I'll try to send it out again. Se September 16th, he uh, sent an email with the link. PC reappointments is the name of the email. So I think you're going to have a third topic, Kirby, uh, to talk about what we wanted to do about the um, Indigenous Persons Day, because our next planning commission meeting will land on the 11th, which is a city hall is going to be closed. So I don't know if we wanted to skip that meeting, push it to Tuesday, um, 
whatever the decision is, that way I can go and take care of getting the rescheduling. So the, the big issue there for everybody to know is that, um, you know, that's a day off for Mike. So um, rescheduling is probably the right thing to do so that, so that we have him. Um, is everybody okay with the Tuesday after? So instead of meeting Monday next time, we meet on the second Tuesday? RPC, but I don't think that should stop you if it works for everyone else. Yeah, I probably can't make that meeting um, either, but it may not matter. So you may have, well, you won't have a new reappointing until the next, until the 13th. So anyway, Tuesday. Yeah, I'm actually going to be traveling that week. So I'm going to be, that's going to be tough for me too. Okay. Uh, do we want to? I can join you, Kirby. <laughs> <laughs> we want to. We want to be able to. We want to be able to work on the the city plan and vote out chapters, possibly. So, um, Ariane and Aaron, would you make it? That would be four at least. I'd check with my wife, but I think so. Yeah, I can make it. I, yeah, I think so. I should check if there's a dueling meeting, right? But I'm pretty sure make it okay i think um another possibility would be to meet on either the first or the third monday those become very tricky because we've got um drb and drc are first and third so okay orca can't hit everybody okay that's good to know well let's 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 plan on i guess we'll plan on tuesday the 12th um and if if uh, any of us four can't make it, let's uh, then we'll we'll figure out something different. Sound good? So just if you find out you're not available, Ariane, John, or Aaron, just let us know. Um, okay. Thanks, Mike, for for reminding me of that one. Uh, and Kirby, I could uh, give input on whatever was being worked on on Tuesday, that Tuesday, and I could come to the first 15 minutes of the meeting. I would just have to pop over to CBRPC. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Please do. Any anyone's, of course, free to, to send us some comments or leave comments on the Google Drive for the chapter. What chapter will we be on then, Mike? Assuming we have housing done tonight. Uh, I'll have to go and see. I'm currently working on economic development, so I'm hoping that I'll have something um, wrapped up for that. Otherwise, I've got a couple of chapters that are in process that I could probably move forward. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, for economic development, we yeah, this the working group hasn't met. Um, Yeah, because I, I thought that would come later. Um, I'm not sure what to do about that. I mean, maybe we could do it without the working group, or it's it's one I'm I, and, you know if anybody I'm working on it in the drive itself, so I'm throwing down a lot of notes and thoughts and stuff. So um, the original draft that was put together was put together by MDC by the MDC director, so it's kind of a new. So I've, I've just kind of said where they were going, I don't think really makes a lot of sense. So I've kind of come back to try to re reshape and, and start to think about things. And I haven't started to compress it. So there's like still three aspirations. And I know we'll probably want to try to figure out how to squish that down. But I tried to box economic development into a couple of pieces to see where we could go with it. Um, and then I'm working on the goals right now, and then we'll try to see where the strategies go. Um, but we can certainly, to a certain extent, maybe work on uh, aspirations and goals as a planning commission as well, just to kind of think through, you know, I'll have some ideas down there, we'll have a bunch of stuff in there, and we can kind of hammer out the, the last of it together. Okay, if we feel like we need more time, I mean, maybe we could, um take a smaller chapter on like public service or 
utilities or whatever is ready. Yeah, utilities and facilities is fairly close. Um, it's unfortunate public works is so understaffed right now. Um, I've just been trying to get some time to go and, and sit down and meet with them so nothing kind of gets out ahead of where they want to go. I don't think there's anything in there that is, but I just wanted that opportunity to sit down with them and have that conversation. But if it doesn't happen, I don't think it would hurt for us to start moving ahead with utilities and facilities because I don't think there's anything in there that should concern members of DPW. I just don't want to, you know, get any relationships off on a bad foot. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, that sounds fine. But yeah, I'm definitely open to, to tackling something smaller and and giving economic development time because that's probably our next big one after housing. Uh, okay, well, the next thing on the agenda, unless does anyone have anything they'd like to comment to the group on before we go on? Okay, uh, next thing on the agenda is uh, public business. No members of the public are here, so we'll move on. Which brings us to the minutes. People can take a look at the minutes from September 13th real quick. We have a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Motion from Stephanie. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second from Marianne. Anybody need more time? Okay. Those in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Minutes approved. And that brings us to the uh, the housing chapter. So to catch everyone up, I sent a, an email to everyone uh, about um, some work I'd done on it. Uh, let me pull it up. So, uh, in hopes of getting some, some work done tonight, I went ahead and filled in the strategies uh, as well as the aspirations and goals in the template online. To do that, I drew from the housing uh, chapter from 2019 uh, and also from the work of the housing subcommittee. Um, there's a, a document that we were, there's like a working document that we had been working on entitled collapsing the housing chapter uh, that's that's also on the Google Drive. And I, I tried to pull everything from that and also everything, mostly everything from the plan from before, or just to give us something to get started on tonight. Uh, I used the aspirations from our last discussions on this and then I used the goals from the previous housing uh, chapter uh, and modified it to fit the aspirations and I, and I custom them out. There's also stuff that's cut out that we had decided that uh, was more appropriate for transportation. Um, so with that we can we can jump in and read through these things and, and folks go ahead and, and give their comments. Um, after we talk about the, the aspirations, goals, and strategies right now, we're gonna, uh, we can vote on it. We can have some ideas or some ideas out there. We can kick it back to Mike. He may have some strategies he wants to fill in. 
um, later. Uh, and then when we go over the, the, chap, the, the chapter language tonight, um, I'm not going to do the walkthrough to save time. Um, I, I'm trying to respond to feedback from, from folks who said that, you know, it wasn't their preferred style. So we're just going to talk about any aspect of the, the chapter language that anybody wants to point out or bring up. And otherwise, we'll just assume it's read and vote for it, vote on it without reading it um, out loud here. So with that, uh, let's we'll start with the aspirations. Um, did, uh, should I share my screen? Is that what, is that, would that help? Um, yeah, you might as well. Uh, that way, if there's anybody who's watching the recording of this or watching it later on, they'll see what we're talking about on their screen. Okay. Everybody see it? Yep. Okay. So we, uh, this is based on our discussions from before. I may have wordsmithed a little bit. I don't remember. Sorry, I'm not going to remember everything. Uh, but right now we have aspiration one, which is having to do with a supply of safe and resilient housing that meets all in current, um, all current future residents. The you know, rental goals and the housing goals fall under that as far as the, the housing supply and the rental stock. And then aspiration B is, uh, we didn't finish this discussion before, but um, it looked like there was interest in having um, a distinct aspiration that's related to fair housing and, uh, and everything that goes with that. So right now it's, as you can see, it says Montpelier will affirmatively further fair housing in order to protect all people from discrimination, promote economic opportunities and create a more diverse, inclusive community. So uh, I, I also left a note there for the first aspiration that I took, we had the word efficient in there for energy efficiency, but since that's going into the energy chapter, I actually took that out because we're not going to have a, a goal about that because it's, it's covered elsewhere. Uh, what do people think about these aspirations? I had one comment, Kirby, that comes up later in the chapter as well. And then in light of Mike's suggestion down there in line 12. Um, so for aspiration A, it looked like Mike was saying that A dealt with zoning and imp implementation. So um, having, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure if it might be worth being a little bit more specific about a diversity of adequate or of housing supply, like the mix of type sizes, occupancies and levels of affordability. Because I understand that aspiration as written sort of implies that, which, works. Um, but then in the chapter, we kind of get into it a little bit more specifically. And so maybe that's like enough, maybe just just kind of expanding upon it in a pointed way in the chapter is enough. But um, I wouldn't be opposed to adding those words about the mix of type sizes, occupancies and levels of affordability back into aspiration A, and maybe saying, you know, in order to meet the needs of all current and future residents. So that might be a little wordy. I don't know. I defer to what people think. It, it may be enough to just sort of define it and blow it out in the chapter itself and keep it brief in the aspiration. Does anybody have a response to our song? Um. The way I was thinking, looking at this, was that the 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 type size and and having housing stock that um, meets all needs goes into B a little bit. Um, I mean, I'm not too worried about it. I'm fine if A and B kind of cover a little bit of the same ground, but it was it's, um, just a thought. Kirby. What's the definition of resilient housing? That was my other, my other <laughs> comment. It's, okay. it's, it's, as far as this goes, my understanding is it's like it's flood resiliency. Um, the, in the chapter later. The, the like 
goal um, goal two A here it says maintains um, the safety, health, and resiliency of our homes and neighborhoods. That's where the resiliency comes up again for the goals, and then for strategies. Um, Not a good sign. Uh, am I spelling this wrong? I swear it's there. It is spelled wrong on number two. Oh yeah, look at that. Okay. Problem with uh, with the Excel version, it doesn't have any spell check on it. So, did I spell that correctly? Um. So yeah, it looks like in the in the strategies, the only um, strategy is the enforcement of river hazard areas in order to protect development of the most hazard um, in the yeah. most areas and developers to elevate buildings to be safe in the flood hazard areas so and and i'm pretty sure that's the only place it comes up in strategies so i mean it's it's probably another one of those ones like efficiency where we can kind of have a debate of whether or not it needs to get reiterated here because we just did the natural resources chapter where we talked about that's why we're doing the mapping that's why we do the um, it's kind of a little bit of the turning things over. The first one was protecting the waterways and protecting and identifying where natural hazards exist. And this one here is kind of looking at it from the housing standpoint of saying, keeping the housing out of the hazardous areas to keep people safe. Um, as long as it's in one place or the other, it can be in both and that's not an issue, but as long as it's in, at least in one place, we're covered. Um, yeah, I, as someone who talks about flooding all day, every day, most days, I struggle with that a little bit because I think it it's it's hard to to consider what we would do to the houses themselves in Montpelier to really make them resilient to flooding, given the fact that a lot of Montpelier is in a the downtown is in a special flood hazard area. I don't think we're going to elevate all of those properties. Um, so I think there are some things we could do, but it's. I don't know well, we how much be, you would actually be doing to the houses themselves. We would elevate the new construction anyway. Right, so we could have better standards so that new construction has to be elevated. Mm -hmm. Two feet above the floodplain. Yeah. Do we have any, um, I, uh, let's, let's, I, I, wanna, I wanna circle back to Marcelo's thing. I feel like um, we left that unresolved, but uh, do, do we have any suggestions for, to, to modify this to make it more clear and accurate? I mean, we could change the aspiration language to mention to say flood resiliency. Um, so, it, is that is is that something um, that people like to throw the word flood in there? Yeah, I think I like that. Natural hazard resiliency or something. It makes it more clear. You don't. Know? Have to dig in the pair uh in the chapter to know what we mean by that okay. are we specifically only talking about flood resiliency though i mean is it possible that we could be talking about other kinds of climate resiliency and um as well we aren't yet but we could in the future Uh, yeah, I'm fine with anything. If anybody has a suggestion, I'm struggling with these goals. Um, I can't say for three of them. I definitely will have no idea if ever we'll be able to say that they'll have be met. They'll be met or not. And then for the top one, I'm also not sure that that's even measurable anymore. Um, nor is it necessarily. It's, it's a messy or complicated measure. Like I, I feel like something cleaner is just like we 
we want more housing and all types of it and we want more people like number of people and, and homes seems like it's really what we're after <clears throat> but more is more is not a measurable goal so are you is there some other way to rephrase that that well, could well, still yeah, make yeah. it a measurable goal yeah yeah i mean we could we could certainly you know select a number um and I, i'm not going to throw something out you know off the top of my head here i guess i could but uh, i don't i'd be just making it up uh It feels like a more of an aspirational statement. Now, I'm not saying I disagree with you, but it might it might fit a little bit under aspiration A. Yeah, there's an adequate supply of housing um, to help further, you know, Montpelier's growth or something like that. Yeah, but I'm just trying to get to like, okay, at the end of this, are we going to be able to say that we've done that or not done that? And what's something we can tangibly work towards? And, you know, figuring out exactly what an adequate supply is, is, is maybe not completely possible or necessarily that valuable either. You know, odds are we, no matter how much, how much housing we build, we probably won't meet adequate supply right so what's like a realistic number or even just slightly beyond realistic that we can we'd want to shoot for is there anything in terms of that we know of that would be problematic in terms of our capacity for water or sewer that could serve as a good like well, we can't, you know, we can't build 5,000 homes because that would probably exceed that. Certainly probably won't do that regardless, but I'm just wondering if there's an, any other kind of physical limitation for us to be aware of. And aside from that, you could pick a number, you know, 1,000, 100 a year. I know we've done things like that in the past. Um, that just becomes like a very simple to understand clear towards what we want you could certainly break it down into you know rental versus non-rental or um or or looking at our our housing type you know or uh demographics you know we've got what are we we're at like 92 percent uh only white households like maybe we want that to be a different number in eight years that could be a clear measure of like, what does it mean to successfully create a community that's inclusive of diverse people? It means that they've actually moved here, you know, not that we've created a lot of pamphlets that says that we support those things. We have, we have, if we wanted to base it off of community services, we, there is some language in the chapter here that's a little helpful. Um, so Montpelier currently has the capacity to increase our population without creating problems of insufficient services. So, I mean, that was one thing you mentioned, like, um, are you thinking like we could, if, if we wanted to redraft it in that terms, would that be, would that be better? Like increase, increase the housing stock to the, to the point to which community services, um, are able to, I don't know, meet the needs of that housing, like make that the goal? I, I don't understand the capacity of them enough to, to know whether or not that'll be a limiting factor or not. And something tells me that we probably won't build enough homes to hit up against any of those ceilings. I could be wrong, uh, but... So if that's the case, and if people are on board with picking a number of homes, you know, what is that number going to be? And I don't know. Yeah, the reason the reason we chose those two numbers is those are um, real estate market standards. So if you have rental vacancies above 5%, that's when you start to have um, prices it's where the prices start to be in balance when it comes to rental. You want to be in that area of about 5% rent, 
rental vacancies because then there's enough for turnover and it's not driving up prices. When you're less than 5%, then you end up with um, uh, prices being driven up, which is why the prices are going up. And, and the, the similar figure that the real estate folks look at, and these are taken nationally, is prices will rise when you have less than six months supply. And it's a, it's kind of a funky number, but it's a, it's a, how long houses stay on the market, um, how many houses are selling and how many of them are on the market. And if you have less than six months supply, um, then your prices are gonna go up. Um, and as anybody knows right now, the prices are, the, they're selling in weeks and months. So there's- Before market. They're, they're in the negative numbers in terms of, they're selling before they go on the market. Yeah, so, so <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, so that, that that's why the, the housing committee kind of chose those numbers was that basically just keep keep building rental housings till we hit 5% vacancies. And that could be hundreds, that could be many hundreds, could be a thousand units before we finally reach 5% vacancy where we can understandably expect that according to market forces, the prices should stop going up once we can get vacancies up to 5%. Um, and then there are a couple other factors that could go into trying to make sure we are at 5%. You know, that's why there's some conversations about trying to figure out how to regulate um, Airbnbs because what happens is you create a unit, it goes onto um, Airbnb and it's not available. So you end up with a certain dynamic of other things, but mostly what they're talking about is our biggest issue we have is a supply issue. And currently we're nowhere near 5%. Um, and the six month supply of housing fluctuates really fast. Unlike the rental housing, which pretty much stays measured. Um, the six month supply can fluctuate in a matter of six months. It could wash itself out um, and, and we're back to six month supply. It really depends on, um, it's a much more fluid number and much more difficult to to manage. And that's that's one one change I made by the way of the wording of this when I when I plugged it in here was I, I included the words continuously maintain for each of these goals. Um, because it's not like the goals met if we hit a six month supply once. Um, the idea would be to continuously maintain it. Um, okay, so for the for the sake of time, I'm gonna ask anyone who if you're in favor of looking for an alternative way to define this, like like John's interested in, uh, raise your hand so that we have an idea of whether we want to uh, try to try to come up with a different way to define it, or if we want to just stick with what's here. So raise your hand if you're interested in something different. Yeah, I don't Everyone think that I don't think rental vacancy is a good way to go. So I I am raising my hand. Okay, I'm seeing three. And hey, three and a half. I, can I ask a question, though, John? Why is the rental vacancy and the, the housing supply timeline? What's what's problematic about that? I, I honestly don't know why. I'm, I'm just trying to understand it better. Yeah, I think theoretically it can it can be helpful. And like Mike said, there are these national standards. But we're we live in a very small community, and that number is not readily available nor reliable. It's also messy and as Mike said complicated so um, really it's not like as a community we don't really care exactly what a vacancy rate is right we care about whether people have housing and and we are growing as a community and that people's needs are met so it's this is sort of like supposed to be an indicator of whether or not that's happening and it could serve some purpose around that. But again, it's like, okay, well, how many, how, how will we know when we get to that 5%? That's a little unclear. And it's just, it's sort of abstract. Um, so really what we want is more people and more housing, right? So let's say that and let's count that. And I don't think we'll ever get to a point where we'll be at 5% vacancy anyway. The only places where you'll see that across the state are those communities and that have seen, you know, significant decline. Uh, and even there, I don't think they're way off from 5% vacancy. So that could be an, an, not the best Vermont specific indicator. 
the other thing is like the type of housing, since we have such a limited housing supply, you could uh, conceivably get to those higher vacancy rates if the type of housing that you built is not affordable to X percentage of the population. So imagine if you have some kind of larger scale luxury housing development that can't meet those vacancy rates. We have a small enough housing supply that those numbers can be, those vacancy numbers can be um, pushed one way or another. So in my mind, it's just like, let's just build more housing and those could be of different types of housing and let's have more, more people in our community. Okay, uh, well, <clears throat> Barb, go ahead, but let's, let's, yeah. try to, let's try to speed this up, guys. We need to have some measure, and it's actually, could because we're a small community, it should be very easy to determine if we have 5% vacancies, because we know the number of rental units, and we can determine the number of vacancies. We can certainly determine it for residences as well. So it gives us a goal. And the thing I like about it is that it's, it's flexible as, as our uh, population increases. Um, so do, does the number of units that we need to be supplying. So it's, it allows for that. And it's a very, you know, it really should be a pretty simple thing for us to do. If we were in a big city, that would be tougher, but it's, it's really not that hard here. So let's, what do you guys think of this? Just um, the, I, I it's, it's a matter of how we're going to measure it. I think, you know, we're all on board for increasing the supply. It's just how will it be measured? Uh, so I don't think it's going to affect the strategies too much to, to change the goal language. But uh, John, why don't you um, come up with something and for the next meeting as a, as a replacement as a better way to do this. And then we can take a look at that specific thing. And then, and then feel free to reach out to any of us during the course of that for input to improve it. Sure, I can do that. If someone wants to send me Montpelier's vacancy rate numbers, historic vacancy rate data, that would be great. I think you might want to check with either the realtors who are keeping track of it or uh, potentially other people who are writing regular reports. Mike, is that something that uh, Kevin Casey would keep track of? I don't know if we, I'll have to check with him on the rental vacancies. Um, the, the month supply is a standard number that is generated every month by the, by the, um, by the folks at the Realtors Association. Um, but the vacancy rate, I don't know. I'll have to check with Kevin. Um, Kevin works my office, community development specialist. He's also a licensed real estate agent. So um, if, if the number of vacancies is available, he would have it. But I, I think like John, like John is suggesting, I don't think there's a standard number that we can, you know, as I said, month supply is something we can just capture from the Vermont Realtors Association and it's a, it's a calculated number. Um, I don't know if such a number exists for rental vacancies. I think um, Kevin has been putting together some numbers for the housing task force, Mike. Yeah, we periodically have a number. I don't know if it's a standardized number that comes out in time or if it's a number that um, gets basically assembled by looking at a variety of other of other facts. Because I know he's talked about, you know, you know, an estimate of 40 rental vacancies at any time. Um, you know, when, but when you're talking about 2,000 units, most of those 40 are um, tied up in other ways. But um, I'll have I'll I'll have Kevin get in touch and and let you guys know and let John know. Okay, that's great. So let's just let's just plan to do that so that we can um, so we can we can move on and then we can we can tackle it later. But it seemed like people were interested in some alternative ideas. So go for it, John, and, and get back to us. Uh, I, I want to circle jumping, back. Yeah, I was going to say, if you jump back to the aspirations, I, I think if we start at the top and work our way down, I think the aspirations, when I reviewed what you put together, I thought I could see where all four of those pieces fit in. Um, so I, you know, and I think I was thinking the same way Marcella was about a few of these um, pieces about the diversity and the mix of housing types. And I was like, well, I guess if we're talking about housing that meets the needs of all then it's assumed that we are providing a mix of types, houses, and occupancy levels. So I, I kind of figure that that all fits in. 
Um, so I thought these two aspirations were, were good and would capture everything that needed to get captured. So that was my opinion on, on that, that part of it. Okay. Yeah, the more we talk about it, maybe it doesn't make sense. Maybe we just flesh it out a little bit more in the chapter and, you know, basically just by that, I mean, put a very fine point on like, in order to meet aspiration A, you know, the needs of current and future residents, we will, you know, try to have a supply of housing in a mix of type sizes, blah, blah, blah. And I think we've had that in a couple other chapters where we went through where in the, I guess the, I'll call it the working draft, we would, we kind of have, you know, um, transportation. Um, we want to have uh, uh, the, you, being able to live in Montpelier without owning a car. Um, but in the working draft, we kind of defined in six or seven pieces what that meant. But when it came to the compressed version, we kind of struck all those out, um, basically because we, you know, we're trying to condense it down. And our goal is that you can live in Montpelier without having to own a car. Um, and here are all the strategies, and we compress the strategies and com compress the goals. But it's all still there. But it was written out long form in the working draft, so that way, if somebody really wanted to understand, well, what does that mean? then we could have this this longer piece. And I think that's what we'll have here is in the working draft, the draft, you know, the, that, you know, the ABCD kind of breaks that into its pieces to go through and say, if you really want to understand what it means to have housing for all, this is what we're talking about. Um, or to meet the needs of all folks, this is what it's going to mean. We're going to need a mix of housing types, a mix of housing sizes, mix of occupancies, and a mix of levels of affordability. Um, so I think that's, I think it's all, it's all there. I think we've done this before in previous chapters to kind of cut the extraneous out. Our, our current ACS vacancy rate is 8% with a margin of error of 10%. <laughs> ACS is probably the worst source of data. <laughs> it is pretty bad. It's a great source if you've, for, Larger Certain, populations. Yeah. yeah, larger populations and stuff that's a little bit less dynamic. Um. Okay. <laughs> so so what I'm hearing is like people are are basically fine with aspirate the aspirations as they're written right now. And we can we can move on to the goals. Because John did point out some other things about the the other goals we can get to. But before we do that, I just want to make sure everybody's okay with the aspirations right now. Yeah. Circling back. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so John, you mentioned how you thought goals two, three, and four were uh, lacking measurability, or what was it? Yeah, I mean, my when I read all of these, the first thing I ask myself is, can I say with certainty that we'll we will have met this goal or not met this goal? And when I read those, I struggle to do that. And I think some of the sense we've talked a little bit about this was that not everything is going to be able to be measurable. Um, you know, take for instance, the reason why we have building codes and we enforce the building codes, um, the residential building codes, you know, that we're one of a few communities that enforces residential building codes. Um, but the reason we do is to maintain safety. And if we just go through and say, well, because it's not measurable, we really shouldn't be having it as a goal. Um, I think that's, you know, I, I think there are many things that we do that we don't necessarily measure the the outcomes or the outputs necessarily, but it's being done with a specific goal in mind. And you know, like enforcing building codes is one of them. So, I mean, so I don't know if this helps or not, but the, the, the goal is to maintain safety, et cetera. And then here's the four strategies that we have right now to do that. Three of them are continues. So it's continue to enforce building and health codes. Or no, two of them are continues. Uh, and then there's conduct a housing survey to, um, to, to find out how uh, the rental units are, are meeting housing standards. And then continue to enforce the, the river hazard area regulations. 
and then there's a strategy to this would be the only thing that's not maintaining i guess amend the sprinkler incentives program to add opportunities to reduce the cost of retrofitting structures that's um th those are the measurable things i suppose uh for that goal I'm struggling with the uh, sprinkler incentives program. Add opportunities to reduce the cost. What does that mean? In other I mean, words, are yeah. in, incentivize the city pay gives it pays incentives to reduce the cost. That came from the existing plan, so that's not my language. So <laughs> I don't know that so we can we can improve it. In of specificity, I think it's a little higher up. There were a couple of improve. The action verb was in improve and they felt a little non-specific to me. And I was thinking, yeah, improve provisions of the tax stabilization program, improve the accessory dwelling unit program. I just don't know, that just mean fund more or change specifically. I would think we would wanna be a little bit more specific there. That way it would become measurable, at least as in we did it or we didn't. Well, in, in those two cases, the specific point is to provide incentives. Um, and that's how we could improve the accessibility of those. The, the use of them would be to give incentives, but we didn't specifically say that further down. What's the, what is the incentive in those programs? Is it more money? Um, well, it's the, certainly for the ADU program breaks. it is. It's basically property tax breaks. Yeah, the, oh, way it's, no. the way it's written, the way it's written in here is continue to provide incentives through the sprinkler incentives program to reduce the cost of retrofitting structures for sprinklers and um yes the that is a tax savings you get a tax discount it's not exactly breaking it's not exactly breaking records now in terms of what's happening so it seems no like but the idea is not to get rid of it i i try to capture all of the things that we are doing already as a municipality um and that is so if, a program that does exist. Yeah, if we're adding opportunities, though, what are the additional opportunities? Um, whereas before we specified, you know, some are, in, are incentives, what are the opportunities that we might add to this? Yeah, and I was just saying what is in the plan itself. So this is what, what is in Kirby's on the screen, not what is in what the task force sent to you guys. What the housing task force sent to you guys says, continue to provide incentives through the sprinkler incentive program. It doesn't say to add opportunities. And the add opportunities might have come from the collapsing document, Barb, from you. I, I mean, yeah. I think you might be criticizing your own language right now. Well, it probably is because it needs more specificity. Um, certainly if, I mean, actually, I this is the one I have the most trouble with anyway. Um, are we talking about residential sprinkler systems? Are we talking about commercial? I mean, it's a whole world of difference. So, um, but I, I didn't remember seeing any distinction in the original document. Okay, like, so a threshold question here for our purposes and um, developing the strategies, are people more in favor of continuing the sprinkler incentives program as it's currently running, or do you want to try to bolster it so uh and then and then we can talk about how we bolster it if that's actually something that we're going to have as a strategy but it's 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 currently a continue so if you're in favor of just continuing it will you just raise your hand indicate that does anyone know enough about it to... I was gonna say, I don't... no have we gotten any sort of feedback that says it really needs like a boost or, and I guess I would say that with the other two that are the improved, the, that I mentioned the, up top. So this, I mean, 
this the continue language came from the housing task force, right, Mike? So I guess we can infer that they didn't think it needed a boost. Yeah, we but can I'm, probably make those. I'm not sure that's the something they even discuss, is it? The, the sprinkler incentives program, is that within their purview? I mean, it is from the standpoint of they make recommendations as to how things affect housing. Um, you know, in the past, they came out, you know, in support of your proposal to remove the sprinkler requirement um, because they it was argued that it was a barrier to the construction of new housing. So they, you know, they review anything that has an impact on housing um, and make a comment. And the fire chief and the building inspector had their, you know, gave their two cents on what they felt should be the requirement. Um, so does this even exist? I thought it was for the, because we required it of, we required sprinklers of, single family homes and duplexes, whereas no one else did. So then we created this to help offset that, but then we got rid of the sprinkler requirement. So does this still This still exists. Look like? This as still exists as an incentive. If you if you it's not mandatory, but if you chose to put a sprinkler in your house, you could contact the assessing off the off the assessor. And I believe he will reduce your property taxes by 10% if you install that. And I don't know if it's just, I believe it's just the municipal rate. Um, so you take the municipal portion of your taxes and that's how much it would it would re reduce. Um, the, the larger point here is for multifamily. If we're talking strictly about housing, it's about multifamily housing uh, where they might not otherwise, it might be an existing building that doesn't have sprinklers because this is specifically about retrofitting. So um, I don't know, it would be good to know how many units have actually taken, uh, multifamily units have taken advantage of this program um, by virtue of, uh, it seems like um, in calculating it, it seems like the incentive needs to be higher, but um, it doesn't matter. Um, really, Mike, Mike, is this? I mean, I, I made the assumption that this was available for if you were going to put in 20 units and put in sprinklers, that this is available for that. Is that true? I, uh, so I'll talk a little bit generally at first. So, usually, what happens when we do these is I'll go through, and um, if you look at all of the ones that we've already approved, they'll have the that topic line like you do and they'll have a large chunk so usually i'll go through and explain what is in fully involved in this um so what would happen is once you guys approve this i'll go through and and like the transportation plan like the energy plan th they're going to be much bigger descriptions underneath that continue the sprinkler incentive program where it'll explain the full details in this case i don't know the nuanced details of um, I'm pretty sure everybody who's got a sprinkler. So in the case of commercial and industrial, you are required under state rules, unless you get a waiver to put in a sprinkler. So there's been a question and I know it was a debate that, that we've had. I don't remember what the answer was, but there was a debate of should we really be giving an incentive to people who are required to do it? Um, so that was one one question like the like those, but I believe everybody gets that benefit. It was a big push by the previous fire chief. It was kind of an idea of you know we're going to work we're going to try to work ourselves out of a future job, and the idea was if we could get everybody to have um, sprinklers in their homes, then we wouldn't need to be manning a, a, a 19 person fire department, um, and that was the theory back. This is before. Um, Bob Gowans. Uh, that was the theory was that sprinklers fire, you know, sprinklers save lives and we're going to get everybody to have sprinklers. Um, now, whether that's, it, it's still the policy on the books, whether it should change, um, that's, that's up for debate, but I could go through, I'll go through when I put this together to kind of explain what we know. It's, it does this and this is the benefits and this is why we want to continue to do it. Um, 
Well, just, I mean, it's the, this is the cost of retrofitting structures for sprinklers. So these are buildings that currently don't have them. We have a number of buildings in the city that don't have them. If they were built new, they would be required to have it, but they don't right now. And so it, it is actually, it's, a, it's good to have an incentive. Um, it's just a question of, is it enough to make a difference? And how does it, like the, the state has their tax credits and they'll cover 100% of the cost of those in our downtown and growth center, right? For it, for uh, qualifying structures? I think they provide 100% up to a certain dollar amount. Yeah. I don't know. I do know there is there is that grant program and we do assist writing those grant applications. Um, uh, what do people think about rewriting this so that we say that, you know, someone will be responsible for reviewing the sprinkler incentive program and recommending improvements that would lead to more housing development? Is anybody opposed to that? As long as we can think of somebody to who would do, who would look at that and if we do think it would promote more could, housing could could be us or it could be somebody else that that Mike could point out I'm sure Mike could help us with that Um, what do people think of that? I'm seeing a couple of nods. I'm seeing a thought bubble above, above John's head that says, I hate it. <laughs> you didn't know it was telepathic. I think it's fine. I'm a bit indifferent. I don't think this is like a. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we can, we can leave it at that. And like, Mike, we're definitely open to, to further improvements and, and ideas there. Um, to in get general, to put, oh, go ahead. is it a struggle to get people to put sprinklers in buildings, new buildings? Well, no, new buildings they are required to, but in existing buildings. Yeah. Oh, to retrofit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's sort of the vein I was thinking into just because the language, if we're, I don't want to like fight about semantics here. <laughs> if we're yeah, trying to lead to more housing, that's not really what this is doing. If it's about retrofitting, yeah, it's retrofitting existing housing. It goes to the safety. Yeah, and there's kind of a mix of two things that are going on here that I may have to split into two separate strategy bubbles, um, because one is the sprinkler incentive program, which is more than just retrofits. Um, it applies to everybody. Um, building a new home, if you build a new home and you put a sprinkler in it, um, and now it's not required to put a sprinkler into a new home. Um, previously, it had been. Um, and it's now been removed from single and two-family homes. So, um, but if you chose to, you could qualify for sprinkler incentive, you could get the 10% tax reduction. Um, so again, that's one program. And then the second program is how do we handle the cost of retrofitting structures? So if you had a three unit that was going to a four unit, um, 
it's now required to have you know a, a sprinkler is there going to be an incentive that's going to help to get sprinklers to you know to, you know how do we handle that and maybe that's maybe that's where the study is you know what can we do to provide more of an incentive to the retrofits but there is still the existing program for everybody else to put in a sprinkler and the idea is trying to offset some of the costs um, if it costs you ten thousand dollars to put in that sprinkler then um, maybe over a reasonable period of time, that 10% tax savings will add up to help defer enough of that cost to make it worth worthwhile to do. Um, I think the answer is the reason why not many people do it is because it's not enough of an incentive. Um, it does actually pay for itself because it's a permanent tax credit. Um, so it will eventually pay for it. It just may take 50 years to do it, but it will eventually pay off the, the sprinkler if you own the building for 50 years, then. Yeah, and that's the one thing we were trying to do is to increase the tax credit, but put a put an end date on it. And that, that mm -hmm. was getting people who were already in the program, so you get a bunch of people who are vested in the program who don't want that to change because they, you know, they have long ago paid off their sprinkler and are just getting the 10% credits now. Um, and it's just a, a theory of, of how you see it. Um, they see themselves as less of a risk and less needing of the fire department and therefore they should get a tax continue to get their tax credit um, that's policy discussion that's not my where i'm at so okay um so like so noted that that mike may end up turning us into two different strategies but is, is everybody okay with the, the state of it right now i i i I amended it a little bit to um, to focus on affordability of, of rentals and home ownership as opposed to new development. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take it that our just sprinkler discussions over. Uh, do we want to pop back up to this tax stabilization? Does, was there anything further to talk about there? Um, yes, I just those two, those two, number two and number three are unclear. If it's like the same as the sprinkler one, it's just continued to improve or continue to provide incentives or if we have a specific way we're hoping to improve those things. I, I think I, my my understanding is like the, the idea again here would be someone should need would need to review the program and offer recommendations for improvement. Yeah, that would be fair. <clears throat> Number three, the ADU program, um, the city does not actually provide incentives. Those incentives are coming from elsewhere. Um, so <clears throat> once if the city were to provide it, potentially more would happen. But I think your point, Kirby, about having uh, studying those two um, might make sense. Uh, would would people feel better if we if we change the language to say like review and recommend improvements? So the the way it was originally written was to continue the provisions of the tax stabilization program that provide assistance in the development of commercial rental housing units. So the original yeah, so, was to continue so the, to do the, what we're doing. The, the improved suggestion came from the um, the working group. The, the improve changes. as in increase. In other mm -hmm. words, take a take a step forward by increasing them in a reasonable manner. So yeah, that would, in theory, tax stabilization works in one of two ways. You're gonna either increase the percentage 
of tax stabilization or you're increased the number of years. And I think, I believe currently um, commercial housing is eligible for up to 50% tax stabilization for a period of 10 years. I believe at the highest level, if you were to receive the highest level, that's what you'd get. So recommending an increase would mean either increasing the percent or increasing the length of term, which I don't believe we can do. I believe under state law, we're limited to tax stabilizations of up to 10 years. I don't believe we can stabilize beyond that. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure there's a limit to what we is that <clears throat> Is that for any size project? Uh it has right, to be commercial under under state law we can only stabilize commercial projects so we generously defined commercial mm -hmm. to include what are called commercial residential which is five or more units oh. so that those are the only ones that we've i mean if you can find the lawyers that are willing to generously go beyond that, but um, I, we're limited under state law. Um, being a Dillon's rule state, we kind of got to follow what they say. Um, and I believe the tax stabilization language under the state um, puts it at a certain percent and a certain um, only commercial. It looks good like that, Kirby. Yeah, I mean, it's like a review might come up with it. Like if, if, if state law doesn't allow us to, to do any legal improvements or improvements, you know, to the, to the program itself, then we could at least uh, promote it better or something. I don't know. How do people feel about these now? Marcelo, it, it does yeah. does the language I added help or yeah, it still... makes it much more specific if you know if we don't have uh, particular ways to improve. At least this will allow us to get to a suite of ideas to improve or, or maintain. Yeah, and for any of these things, Mike, if you want to put planning commission as responsible, I mean that's fine. But if if there's if there's a group that's more appropriate, that's fine too. Um, okay, so we looked at these. Are there any others that stand out to people? I'm going to take suggestion from Barb note off of that third one because we covered that. There's another suggestion from Barb that might be for discussion here. It's um, this is from the working group and something that she had put in the, the document. Uh, amend the uh, regulation, the, the zoning ordinance to encourage multifamily housing. And, and then the explanation is expand the zoning districts that allow multifamilies permitted or conditional uses. I may have altered the language there to try to make it specific. Yeah, because I can't necessarily remember uh, the discussion on this one, Kirby, as to whether or not we felt that there were more appropriate zoning districts that should have it. I think every zoning allows it, except for the rural district, which doesn't have sewer and water. They don't allow multifamily, but it is a permitted or conditional in every other zoning district. Now, we could have a debate as to whether or not they should all allow it as a permitted use. Um, currently, there are a number of districts where multifamily is uh, conditional use. Um, and really, the conditional use is generally, at this point, looking at one thing, and that's character of the neighborhood. So um, you have to have the density, so you'd have to have a big enough piece of land. But you know, if you were up on Town Hill, and I'll just grab that, or, or maybe even Terrace Street. Um, if you get out in one of these Res 9, Res 2100, 2400 districts, um, if you have a big enough parcel, you could 
um, currently you'd have to go through conditional use to put in a multifamily structure. Um, and it would have to be judged as to whether or not it's in, in the character of the neighborhood. Um, and then they'll argue that we don't need it because our housing occupancy rate for rental housing is at 8%, give or take 10%. Or, the, or they will go through and say that there aren't any multifamily units out here. Therefore, a multi multifamily will be out of character because there aren't any out here. Um, and basically, because it's not out here, we won't allow it out here. Um, but but if in theory, if you had, you know, a, a five acre parcel in these areas, which, you know, res 21 is basically half acre zoning, you could have, you know, on a five acre, you'd have 10 units, that would be multifamily. Um, but, but they still have to meet everything else, even if it was permanent, they'd still have to meet all of the setbacks and massing, right? Yep, setbacks, massing, um, uh, the, the parking requirements, the, um, they'd have to still meet all of those other requirements. Um, so I think there's definitely a good argument. We certainly could review where we think it would be appropriate to have conditional use. Um, but I think as this is written, I don't think it really, I think we've already achieved that standard of allowing multifamily as permitted or conditional, because I think we already do that. Um, but we should review whether or not more districts should have multifamily as, as a simple um, permitted use. If it meets the bulk and massing, um, meets the parking requirements, meets the density requirements, you know, obviously if you want to have. Sounds like it's fine the way it's written. Right? Yeah. I actually like it. Um, I think it's that's a worthwhile thing to do and and it's something that could result in more housing, more units available in the city, which is what it's all about. Anybody else have anything on this? Um, if we don't have any other comments, I can move down to the next, like, um, There's another Barb suggestion to expand the scope and authority of the Housing Task Force Committee. I think originally it was that the Housing Task Force Committee wanted to just continue to exist, basically. And so um, the difference here is that it says to expand the scope and authority. Um, do you remember what else you were thinking there, Barb? Well, I'm just looking on my other computer so I can see uh, what the collapsed version was before it went into this document. Um, haven't found that section yet. Uh, housing task force. Oh, there it is. I just, I took it verbatim. Expand the scope and authority of the housing task force to coordinate housing initiatives. Yeah. Um, right. So basically looking at expanding beyond what they're doing now, because um, having attended some of their meetings, it does seem as if they're pretty constrained in terms of how they can use funding. Um, and essentially the funding has to end up being funneled through housing um, authorities. So I think that there is more potential in the housing task force to be able to take a proactive role because the city can't. So um, <clears throat> housing task force could become the active, the actor here and make a difference. What do other people think about this? Do we need to um, sure up the language a little bit? I have to say, I don't think they're going to be interested in, in that change. Personally, I just. Not yet, Mike, but they could be in the future. <laughs> 
<laughs> Wait, they don't want an expanded scope and authority? Um, I think where it wants to go is to, you know, we, um, you know, we like to, or, or we describe that we don't, we don't build anything. So we aren't, you know, we're, we're trying to come up with programs and incentives and doing community development and working with grants to help our partners be the help housing developers. We aren't the housing developers and the housing task force um, trying to make them housing developers, I don't think is where they want to go. They want to continue their role as um, identifying the barriers to housing and incentivizing and, and helping our partners to develop housing rather than having us become housing developers ourselves. Um, but they're really, in terms of restricted, in terms of, of what kind of housing, it's not the development of multiple housing types. It's not the development of, you know, even potentially market rate. It's only low income housing that they can pass on through the housing authorities. So the idea would be to give them a more latitude. In other words, because the city can't. No, they can spend money on things that aren't low income housing. Um, in how, how, the, you know, this, this housing plan talks about wanting to make sure we expand housing for everybody. I mean, this, this housing plan itself that we're looking at came from them and they've advocated we need housing in, in, of, for all incomes, low income right up to, to higher income. And they identify the barriers to those housing as well. Um, the first time home buyer program is um, not necessarily income qualified. It's being a first time home buyer. Um, there are a number of um, programs that they could create that wouldn't maybe not necessarily specifically target low income. Um, I mean, a lot of them generally do because higher income folks have more resources available to them but I don't think there's anything that technically prevents them from advocating for um, other housing programs that might be more broadly applicable. All right, so it sounds like this doesn't do anything. Um, yeah, do we, do we want to put it aside for now? And Mike, would you be able to ask the housing task force if they had any interest in this if it resonates at all i mean i could i could certainly ask them just yeah you could just ask the planning commission's wondering if you have an, if you feel like there's a need for expanded scope and authority if they say no then that would inform your decision A, there's another thing I added here that I just I put it in almost as a uh, question. Get to that in a second. Um, oh shoot! Well, I'm just, I'll put it over there for now anyway. It's not the right box for it. Uh, so <clears throat> a little further down here, I, um, I, I don't remember my thought process exactly here, but when I was going through this, it, there was, there was some content that I was looking at here that made me question whether, um, there's, a any kind of guidance for the housing trust fund to decide or to incorporate the, like thinking about, um, helping make sure that how that, that they're that the money's being spent to help affordable housing as opposed to just anybody who's just asking um but but maybe this isn't a need maybe this is already taken care of in the current process so i'm just wondering what what are like folks who know more about the housing trust fund think about is is there is there a need for a policy or guidance that helps guide it towards need as opposed to just anybody. 
Mike, can you like tell us more about it? Because I'm. Yeah, so I think the housing trust fund, um, it gets an annual allocations. We also have some extra money that revolves back. So a lot of the funds that we loan out are 0% loans that are paid back um, on sale of the house. So we get an, a number of these revolve back over time. So we do have a set of funds that, that come in. Um, I know we developed the policy recently. I don't know what it was, but um, off the top of my head, all the details of it. But a lot of the, the housing trust fund policies are really geared towards how you can establish programs to spend the money. So it's kind of, you kind of got to think of it as a two-step thing. You don't actually spend the money out of the trust fund directly, usually. Um, we will sometimes go in for specific projects to make a, a donation of $100,000 to the Berlin homeless shelter, for example. I believe that's a proposal that either if it hasn't come in, it will be coming in. Um, but most of the other ones are programs. So the first time home buyer program will request $60,000 out of the housing trust fund. And these are the rules that we're going to use to administer those funds. And then the housing trust fund committee, which unfortunately is a separate committee than the housing task force. So the trust fund committee will first make a recommendation that the trust fund will then forward on to the um, city council and the city council will then approve the program for being used. So um, city council can then go through and change the program. So usually these programs are developed by our partners. So we always say it's our first time home buyer program. Well, it's not, it's down streets first time home buyer program. Um, they already have a, a, a program that qualifies people and spends the money. And if you qualify for a down street $10,000 first time home buyer program, and you're buying a house in Montpelier, we will match that $10,000 with another $10,000. So that's how the program works. We have very low overhead on, main, on, on administration because they're doing all the work. We're just throwing an extra $10,000 onto the, onto the sum. Um, so that's kind of the way it works is anybody can come in with a proposal and we are now getting a similar proposal for the ADU program. So the ADU program we're currently doing is a pilot program run by um, um, Tyler Moss and his group. Um, eventually when those funds are gone, we wanna continue that program. So we're gonna to have to come up with a program, who's gonna administer it. Um, and then they will request m um, money from the housing trust fund on an annual basis to say we want uh, sixty thousand dollars going to this program too, um, and we'll just have to make sure we have enough money to support the program for that year. So that's really how it works: is programs come in or projects come in to ask for funding. Most of the projects are only very these high-profile projects. Um, uh, Ta Taylor Street, French Block, um, Berry Street, some of the Berry Street projects. Um, basically, if it's a down street project, if it's a housing Vermont project, they probably come in and ask for funding. Um, so I guess that's the best I can summarize for how it's currently used. The policies we have are policies for how to create a program to spend the money. It's not so much the policies. It's, it is not itself the program. So, so it, it sounds like may, maybe we don't need this idea. Man, what do you think, Mike? I think it's important that we have policies. I just, I might have the housing trust fund or task force figure out what these policies should be. I think we have a policy document um, because we recently went through and, and collapsed out a bunch of other old revolving loan funds. Um, we always get questions from the state and federal government about what are you doing with your old revolving loan funds that have money in it. And so we finally took the, the money out of those revolving loan funds and 
tacked them on to our housing trust fund. So we, in doing that, we had to kind of create a policy document. So I'm pretty sure we already have one. I also, I don't think we need the two, both of the ones above and below that one. I think we can change the first one to say, identify alternative funding to expand the housing trust fund and not have, I don't think we need both. Should we should we combine them though, or just um, just just is it is it worth mentioning this this policy in the plan? What do people think? Like, I threw this in here, but I'm not at all attached to it. Like, if we. Okay. Well, um, they're, they're, they're separate items and they're related. I mean, I think we currently fund the housing trust fund at about $140,000, $150,000 a year. Um, we're trying to get it up to $200,000 a year. So that's one objective. Certainly we could meet that objective by getting alternative funding sources, but the housing trust fund housing task force has very specifically been trying to identify other sources of funding. So they've had discussions about, you know, can we, you know, if we did a local options tax, should we be doing that? Can we get a charter change to tax accessory or um, Airbnbs, um, those types of things? So they are very specifically looking at, you know, where can we get funding that's not from the general fund? Um, can we tax? The sale of mansions. I think there was a discussion about that. You know, if you sell a house that's worth more than five hundred thousand dollars, that a percentage of that will go into the housing trust fund. Um, aren't, aren't they studying revenue sources in order to expand the, the trust fund to get to two hundred thousand in reserves by twenty twenty five? I can let it go. It feels like one thing yeah. to me. If I, you're I think it's, it's two. That's fine. <laughs> it, it can. Yeah, it's it can be two. It can be one thing. I think uh, worded right, we could think? combine them. Do we, anyone else want to combine it or just, or leave it as two strategies? We're talking, we're talking about, you're talking about these two, right? Stephanie? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I skipped, I skipped over the, the other conversation. <laughs> it's okay, you were bored with it. Subtly let us know. Uh, I certainly okay. wasn't trying to cut you off, Kirby. We can go back. No, no. I just I went ahead and moved it over um, to to like a, a thing. Maybe maybe Mike could check in with the housing trust fund when he checks in the um, or the uh, the housing task force when he checks in about the other thing. See what they say. Um, so so I'm putting it aside for now. But but combine them, yes or no? Those in favor of combining, raise your hand. See two hands. I see a half a hand. If no one else cares, it's fine. Just indifferent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll just we'll just keep them as. Uh, what's that, Marcel? I was just thinking. I feel a little underinformed. <laughs> so. Um, we can keep them separate. I mean, it sounded like Mike was slightly leaning toward separate. So whatever. Um. Okay. Going to go on down to the next ones we already covered. This, these are the A2s that go to the second, our second goal, which is about safety, maintain safety, health, and flood resiliency of our homes and neighborhoods. We have these four. Before we uh, go on to those, I just had a comment. I'm not sure where it fit in. The one thing sure. that strikes me that it's missing, but related to um, the, is it like the mark? marketing and outreach program, market existing incentives to housing builders, developers. Um, I feel like we need more, like we have very few builders and developers and the developers we have develop larger scale housing. And I think there's um, room for more 
I think guess what they would be called like small developers. So people doing duplexes and fourplexes that don't think of themselves as developers, like just members in our community. Like I don't think anyone's coming to Montpelier and going to build a bunch of housing. It's going to be like small, small development built by us, you know. And a lot of we we don't have a lot of people either don't have the expertise or don't think they do so one thing i would propose maybe is looking at you now the i think i've mentioned this before the incremental developers alliance does small developer boot camps and i think that sometimes just gets translated and then as we like play telephone or this evolves it's like we'll just have like a marketing and outreach program and i'm not sure if that's where this originated or not but i I would really like us to do like a small developers boot camp to get people to become those. Otherwise, I feel like we're just marketing to the people who know this, the same like three people who know <laughs> know these things. So My John, are you thinking, I mean, it, it could we replace the word developers with something that's more descriptive of the small scale projects that you're referring to? Yeah, I think we could just say like host small developer boot camp uh, from the like very, be just very specific of what I'm talking about. Um, be interesting to see in Montpelier if anybody took that took us up on that because the the whole word developer has a bad connotation. Yeah, in that, that, I think that's the point. And like challenging people, like what is you know. I mean, historically, this is how Montpelier was developed, like the Montpelier that everyone loves, right? It was just incremental, small, smaller um, buildings built by people who lived here. And there's no reason that couldn't, couldn't still happen. There are tons of, I think of architects, landscape architects, attorneys, people, people in real estate, like they have one of like the five skills you need to develop housing if they got together and were trained by uh, some of those other people, they could also start doing these smaller scale developments. So maybe it's wishful thinking, but uh, there are people doing this. And I just put a link in the, um, at least I thought I did. Uh, I saw that pop up momentarily. I don't know what happened to it. Uh, so I, th I threw an additional sentence in there just to kind of add this into what's already there because I feel like it's we could just expand on it. There you go. You have the link. Um, I, th I threw provide training or boot camp for potential small scale developers such as homeowners. Is that does that capture everything? Well, I think what you're you were referring to, John, was something like duplex. You know. Developing a duplex might not necessarily be done by a homeowner. For yeah, example. it's like we need to develop developers. People who don't think of themselves as Barb, you need to become a developer. Like, how do I, we? Don't worry about that. I'm working on that. But um, what we, I mean, we need to figure out another word for developer, John. It's true. Where's your thesaurus when you need it? Yeah, what's another word for a housing maker? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> A creator. <laughs> yeah, a creator of homes, of buildings that have people. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that, that's why I threw this, the such as in there to try to, to, try to get at uh, what we mean by it. I mean, I, I've, I wrote such as homeowners and related professionals. Do something better? Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, we have the boot camp that's great it, it'll and that'll who shows up whoever shows up whoever shows up and i don't think it matters what we put in the plan but do people agree i mean should we be putting energy or effort towards towards yeah. trying to cultivate that in Montpelier? i think it could I think certainly that's make a difference it could make a difference yeah I don't, I don't know that we really need, even need the qualifier. If we're saying potential small scale developers, I think we could end the sentence there. Okay, I can, I can re remove that. You could say like from local professionals or something if you wanted to, but I think the homeowners is gonna throw people off. Professionals and unprofessionals. 
Yeah, local people. Yeah, I mean, the point of it might be to to get non-professionals uh, up to a point of knowing when they need to, to get help, but to be able to do it themselves. Provide training or yeah. boot camp for potential local small scale developers? Yeah, I mean, I think you could leave boot camp out because training sort of says that. I mean, Unless you're planning John, something John more. Seemed, John seemed to like that word, so. Are you planning something more, more um, intense, John? <laughs> I'm on mute. It's a three day boot camp. <laughs> you lock them in the room. <laughs> you can't leave until you learn this. Not in COVID times. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, I think that's... yeah. We've had a couple of different one that that is one of the, the things that was envisioned with that. Um, that program was was the smaller these boot camps to get folks. The other the other angle is to try to get some larger housing developers. You know, a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about, you know, requires the construction of, you know, we kind of have two things. We can't really just break into one to go through and say, oh, well, we just need to do infill. Um, infill is going to be important. It's going to get us, you know, it's where most of the easiest to develop land has already been developed. So we're kind of be doing, going to be doing a lot of infill. But in a few places, we do have um, the need for larger developers. And it's been pointed out, we really don't have a developer class here in central Vermont, um, which is somewhat surprising. You know, if you go to Burlington, you go to Chittenden County, you have multiple professional housing developers who build housing. So when we talk about, you know, developing Saban's Pasture or developing Stonewall Meadows, um, or even just that project that's up on um, the Econo Lodge um, in the old um, Brown Derby lot, the ability to build you know, 45 housing units on a, you know, on a, a two acre lot is, that's, that takes a professional developer class. Um, mom and pop are not gonna be building this, that scale, but we just don't have that scale here. So they are have, that is a proposal of folks that are coming in from Chittenden County. And what we're trying to do as a little bit of that marketing is to try to get some of those folks to start thinking about Montpelier and these areas around here to start considering doing some some projects, you know, where it's appropriate, where it fits the zoning, where it fits the character, but we can't build those. We don't have that class of developer here in town um, or in Washington County. We really need to, to make sure that we can get some folks in who know how to do that scale of project um, in order to do them right. So that's a little bit of what that other side of that marketing is. We need to get, we just don't have enough builders. And we need more small scale builders and we need to encourage a couple of these large scale ones to at least recognize they're not going to move to Washington County there's not enough to do here but to get them to start thinking about moving some of their capital and some of their work out this way would, would help us out a lot. Okay. Well, it would it certainly good. help if they if you know if they had a, a certain approach to projects might guarantee them more success than other approaches and. Um, I think, you know, we've gotten such a bad reputation for developers now that anything we can do would be a, po a step forward. I like the like optimism. The, we have no place to go but up. <laughs> it sounds like the strategy covers both things, local developers and bringing in big ones from outside. So um, this sounds good. Sounds like we've, we've got it all covered there. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to move on. Um, does anyone uh, have anything else on the A1 strategies? Before we go on to A2? Okay. So A2 is a smaller list. It's these four things. We touched on it earlier. Does anyone have anything about the A2 strategies? We already beefed up some of the language under the sprinkler. OK, so I'll move on from A2. At this point, at this point, I'm not trying to get this done tonight, by the way, because we still have the, the chapter. But that's like like the next meeting will will aim to um, take care of the, the rest of the stuff, by the way. 
Uh, okay, so we're on to. Sorry to. <laughs> Can we go back to the building codes thing? I just, I just wonder if there's. I mean, sort of what we're talking about the sprinkler. Instead of just saying continue, is there any improvement in code enforcement or anything that you know would be beneficial or could be looked into? If we were willing to pay for more positions on the city staff, I mean, we currently have a, a someone who does that, does building inspectors, but he's also our health officer and he reviews plans. And, you know, basically we would need more staff. Yeah, I just, I just find all these ones that are, you know, sort of continue or maintain. Theme. I yeah, I agree with that. I look, I look at it. I look at it like, uh, you know, the plans recognizing that this is an area where we're we're pretty good on, and we're not trying to be ambitious about the the A one goals tend to be what we're ambitious about, and these A two goals are more about maintaining because we think we're in a good spot. Mm. That's that's what I think the plan says. Now, like whether we agree with that and want to go that way, it's a different question. Okay. Um, do we do we do we have anything else on on A two? Did anybody else want to respond to Aryan's comment? Okay. Okay. So B one again the uh, the aspiration goes to fair housing, discrimination, diversity, all those issues. The first goal is to maintain the city's commitment to affirmatively furthering fair and accessible housing by focusing on the areas where needs are not currently met. Uh, so this is, this, uh, this language I changed around a bit. Uh, there were some aspects of it that I thought were kind of problematic. Um, it, there was like an emphasis on the city's failings kind of, and I just kind of reworded it so it didn't sound that way. But the, so, so the focus right now in the language is, to, uh, is on fair and accessible housing and then where needs are not currently met. Uh, so there's no really blame there. And then the strategies are ones that go to, a lot of these go to vulnerable populations and uh, some of them are improving things, trying to introduce new access to new things. Uh, so we have this, we have something that, I think this first one's from the current plan, it's the ADA, ADA revolving loan fund program. Um, so this was a this is something that's in our current plan to allow matching fund grants for making housing accessible. Uh, and then the next three, the first one was something that's that's in the plan that was a recommendation from Housing Task Force, I believe, uh, and it's about senior housing projects. I went ahead and created two other ones based on the same idea, but for other areas. So there's senior housing to incentivize that, and then to incentivize the creation of recovery housing. Um, that's that's a concern I've had when it comes to, to housing in Montpelier because the only re like drug addiction recovery housing that exists in Vermont from what I've heard, and, I, and I've heard this from the people from Downstreet, that it only exists in Burlington and nowhere else in Vermont. Um, so, so this would be something that um, where we at least had zoning districts that allow that to to to, to be. So I'm, I'm I'm thinking maybe as a permitted use, but um, and then and then the same thing here is for transitional housing. This came up in my conversation with uh, Shana, who's staff for the for CJAC, Social and Economic Justice Advisory um, Committee. Uh, they, they're they're very interested in, in housing. I told them some of the things we were planning to do with the plan and she was really excited for it, by the way. Uh, but transitional housing, which is to transition 
in times of homelessness, what that goes to. Uh, she thought that we needed something in here for that. So that's that's where this strategy comes from. It's it's phrased in the same way as the senior housing and recovery housing. Um, and then I think these these other two came from I think the housing task force. I guess I'm just wondering on the um, the recovery housing and the transitional housing. And Mike, you can answer this. Is this? I mean, is that more specifically a need to have just group group homes be allowed, or what's the what's the exact like zoning um, category they would fall under? Yeah, I mean, so for the three of them there that say amend the unified development regulations i don't know if those any of those were in the original um from the from the housing task force um so we don't separate out um yeah because that's the the subcommittee's version um but um. the the senior housing, we don't have senior housing as a separate category. We just have housing. So we don't, um, uh, it's, it's not a separate use. And we also already don't, um, we don't regulate the occupancy type. Um, so we don't really get into the, the, the families. So whether it's transitioning homeless, um, and this was true also for um, folks who are coming out of prison as well. Um, our community justice department downstairs, they have a program for helping folks get who get out of prison to get housing and they've got housing opportunities for them as well. Um, you know, that goes to the, the housing for all concept um, but those, those are all, um, we don't separate them out as a separate use. So if it's a single family home, um, it can be used in that other way. I mean, if it qualifies as a group home, then it's protected under state law, um, as congregate living. But if it's just a single family home and you want to rent it out only to folks who have previously been homeless, you don't need a zoning permit. There's not, it's not a special zoning district, um, special zoning classification. It's a, it's a use of a single family home. And so from that standpoint, we're already kind of already allowing that by not, by not identifying it as a separate use, we're basically allowing it. Mike, don't we have senior housing and group homes identified? as different uses? Group homes are because they're separate. Um, so we've split housing into two, two groups, two Uber groups. So one, one group are your dwelling units. Um, so if your if every unit in whatever the structure is, has its own kitchen, bathroom, living, and sleeping facilities, all independent, all separate, then those are the dwelling units. And those are your single unit, two unit, three unit, four unit, multifamily. Your second classification are your congregate living. So those are ones where one of those, <clears throat> one of those four or five uses is shared. So it becomes congregate if let's say you're in a dormitory you have your own private room with your own private lock, but you share your bathrooms and you and you go to the cafeteria to eat. That's a congregate living. That's a separate use and it's classified under congregate living. So group homes tend to be in this latter. Um, they can be in either group, but if they're in a single family home, they're a protected use and are treated. Any single family home can be a group home as long as it's eight or less folks in it, if it's, yeah, I guess, oh, it becomes congregate okay. living. So. Yeah. But senior housing is identified. Oh. It, it, yeah, uh, the reason I pulled this up is it, it, this isn't in red from Barb's document. That means that she pulled it from the current plan. 
like there is something on senior housing already in but we already have an existing use designation for senior housing and a definition so not sure how that fits in um just i have to sign off in a few minutes here but just my two cents i mean i don't i don't think that we need that about the senior housing i mean my experience in working in you know, Vermont and housing for 13 years is that most communities are pretty welcoming to senior housing. So I don't see that as a problem. Um, I don't know if it has been a problem in Montpelier, but um, that's not, and it, you know, as Mike said, it falls under, you know, general multifamily zoning. But I definitely would be interested in, you know, maybe just one item talking about allowing different kinds of congregate uses because I think that's really useful because I think not all um, you know potential uh, recovery housing or homeless housing is going to happen in a single family home and it often does you know there's there's other opportunities for other properties um, I know of a project that was not you know pursued because of the fear of Fear of uh, neighborhood resistance. So I think something about congregate housing would be, be useful. My two steps. That's that's awesome. And it looks like I mean we're gonna have to we're gonna have to like wrap things up. So we can kind of leave it there with like knowing that these are some things we want to um, some strategies we want to maybe improve and, and make better. And it sounds like Ariane, you have some great ideas. So before the next meeting, if you can think about what would make for a good effective strategy in, in this area, or maybe all three of those things. Um, that would be awesome. And then that's where we can just pick it up next time. Does that sound good? I think that's um, the end of the list, isn't it? Or is there more beyond that? There's A4 as well. There's not much, or a B4, I mean. So we're 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 getting there. It looks like we'll be able to definitely wrap it up in the next in the next meeting. And it sounds like we'll have a quorum to do it. And and Ariane said this she'll be able to make it, so um, she can help us with with that. And we can all think about how to improve these and whether there's air like inclus inclusive you know some strategies we can have involved that touch on inclusivity and diversity and stuff that maybe aren't here too. I'd be interested in hearing if people have ideas. But let's let's plan to take it up next time. Then Bart, um, make sure you make sure you download or, or have the most recent zoning that was adopted in February twenty one. We changed those uses, the yep. use listing that significantly. We collapsed it. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I will. Okay. So yeah, we obviously need to, to work on these and polish it. So we'll do that. We'll do that next time and yeah, I was hoping if we hadn't done, I could go through and do the do the kind of match them up to the way the process we'd been doing and kind of fill them in. We're pretty close. Yeah, and if you want to if you want to do it for the ones we've covered so far, that seems fine by me. Do you feel like we need to, to vote so on? No, yeah. I'd rather have you vote on the final one than vote on the cool the concept. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll uh, save these. I'm not going to delete these. I'll create another page to put them on. So we won't lose the history. Well, yeah, this is this was great for making progress. Sorry if I jumped the gun on you, Mike, and by throw by throwing the strategies in there. I um, um, think we had a good discussion tonight. Uh, does anyone want to celebrate this good discussion by motioning to adjourn? Anybody? Where's Where's Aaron? Sure, I'll, okay. I'll do it. So moved. I'll, I'll move it. That's fine. All right, I'll I'll second Aaron. You can let him have it. <laughs> Motion by Aaron, second by Stephanie. Those in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 All right. Adios. Thanks, everyone. See you Thursday. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.